the, <clears throat> the title of my talk today is The Appeal of the Hunger Games, Dystopian Fiction or Tolkienian Fairy Tale. Suzanne Collins' Hunger Games trilogy, The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, and Mockingjay, has been described as science fiction, fantasy, adventure, romance, war story, and dystopian fiction. To be sure, the books are all those things. We see technical technological wonders akin with science fiction. We have elements of fantasy. We've got plenty of adventure. There's a love triangle, war, and an obvious dystopian setting. So what characterizes dystopian fiction? If you research the topic, if you get on Google, you'll find all kinds of lists. Here's one. Common traits of dystopian fiction. Most dystopian films or literature contain at least a few of the following. A hierarchical society, where divisions between the upper, middle, and lower class are definitive and unbending. Two, a nation state ruled by an upper class with few democratic ideals, state propaganda programs, and educational systems that coerce most citizens into worshiping the state and its government in an attempt to convince them into thinking that life under the regime is good and just. Three, there are 12 of these. Three, strict conformity among citizens and the general assumption that dissent and individuality are bad. Four, a fictional state figurehead that people worship fanatically through a vast personality cult. Five, a fear or disgust of the world outside the state. Six, a common view of traditional life particularly organized religion, as primitive and nonsensical. Seven, a penal system that lacks due process laws and often employs psychological or physical torture. Eight, constant surveillance by state police agencies. Nine, the banishment of the natural world from daily life. Ten, a backstory of a natural disaster, war, revolution, uprising, spike in overpopulation, or other climactic event which resulted in dramatic changes to society. 11. A standard of living among the lower and middle class that is generally poorer than in real contemporary society. And 12. A protagonist who questions the society, often feeling intrinsically that something is terribly wrong. Now remember, not all works of dystopian literature or film will have all or even many of these characteristics. Rather, these are just kind of characteristics you see across the broad spectrum of dystopian literature. So, with those characteristics in mind, what are some of the major dystopian works of the 20th century? Three in particular that I want to focus on. Brave New World, 1984, in Fahrenheit 451. Brave New World, written by Aldous Huxley in 1931, it's amazing when you think about that, envisions a world set far into the future, 25th century to be exact, that has a single world government, has eradicated illness, done away with childbirth through genetic engineering and cloning, and produced a world of therapeutic and pharmacological happiness and sexual freedom. Happiness is the highest goal. The purpose of life is to be happy and to fulfill one's genetically determined role in society as either an alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or epsilon. It all depends on how you've been conditioned and bred. Of course, because of the genetic engineering, it is impossible not to fulfill one's predetermined course. Gammas, deltas, and epsilons, for example, have such low IQs that they are unable really to think for themselves. Alphas and betas are so high up in society, on the other hand, that they see the value in their position and all they live for is for pleasure. Food, sex, drugs, the feelies, or movies with seats in them that allow you to feel the sensations of what the actors are experiencing. And so on. As the novel progresses, one discovers, however, that the one world state, it's what it's called, is not perfect, far from it. That there are, in fact, people who don't want to be there. 
and who are either disposed of, terminated, or sent to a reservation. One such character is a character who comes from a reservation. John Smith, also called throughout the novel, the savage. He's raised on a reservation, he's brought into the one world state society, and he detests it. John Smith claims at the end of the novel that he wants to feel sorrow and misery because that partially at least is what it means to be human. Two passages will show what I mean. This is uh, in the last fourth of the novel, so it's, it's nearly over. Mustafa Man, one of the four world controllers, one of the four greatest, highest rulers of the world, is speaking to John Smith, the savage. And he says, the world's stable now. People are happy, they get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. They're well off, they're safe, they're never ill, they're not afraid of death, they're blissfully ignorant of passion and old age. They're plagued with no mothers or fathers. They've got no wives or children or lovers to feel strongly about. They're so conditioned that they practically can't help behaving as they ought to behave. And if anything should go wrong, there's Soma. Soma is a pill that you can take that makes you happy. And if one doesn't do it, then three will pretty much take care of all your problems. The savage listens to this, and he doesn't like it. And he brings up the question of God, because there is no God in the world state. They've done away with God. And he says, if you allowed yourselves to think of God, you wouldn't allow yourselves to be degraded by pleasant vices. You'd have a reason for bearing things patiently, for doing things with courage. I've seen it with the Indians meaning those that he was raised by on the reservations. I'm sure you have, said Mustafa Mond, but then we aren't Indians. There isn't any need for a civilized man to bear anything that's seriously unpleasant. And as for doing things, Ford forbid that he should get the idea into his head. It would upset the whole social order if men started doing things on their own. What about self-denial then? Savage asks. If you had a god, you'd have a reason for self-denial. But industrial civilization is only possible when there's no self-denial. Mon retorts. Self-indulgence up to the very limits imposed by hygiene and economics. Otherwise, the wheels stop turning. They keep talking. The savage says, but God's the reason for everything noble and fine and heroic. If you had a God, my dear young friend, said Mustafa Mond, civilization has absolutely no need of nobility or heroism. These things are symptoms of political inefficiency. In a properly organized society like ours, Nobody has any opportunities for being noble or heroic. Conditions have got to be thoroughly unstable before the occasion can arise. Where there are wars, where there are divided allegiances, where there are temptations to be resisted, objects of love to be fought for or defended, there, obviously, nobility and heroism have some sense. But there aren't any wars nowadays. The greatest care is taken to prevent you from loving anyone too much. There's no such thing as divided allegiance. You're so conditioned that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is on the whole so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. And if ever, by some unlucky chance, anything unpleasant should somehow happen, why, there's always so much to give you a holiday from the facts. And there's always so much to calm your anger, to reconcile you to your enemies, to make you patient and long-suffering. In the past, you could only accomplish these things 
by making a great effort and after years of hard moral training. Now, you swallow two or three half-gram tablets, and there you are. Anybody can be virtuous now. You can carry at least half your morality about in a bottle. Christianity without tears, that's what Soma is. But the tears are necessary. The savage retorts. And then he goes on. You got rid of them. It's just like you. Getting rid of everything unpleasant instead of learning to put up with it. Whether it is better in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Quoting Hamlet, the savage. But you don't do either. Neither suffer nor oppose. You just abolish the slings and arrows. It's too easy. Our next author, George Orwell, wrote the novel 1984 in 1948. And it's a chilling book. Orwell also described a world of the future, though not far into his future and in our past, though not one without war and sickness and death. No, his vision is full of war. Though who the wars are between can change at a moment's notice, as can the history about those wars. The society is divided into the party and those not in. The party is led by Big Brother, who is present everywhere because of posters, spies, and surveillance screens. The novel is closely modeled on the Soviet Union and what Orwell knew of it in the 1940s. The purges of the 30s, the detentions and disappearances of people, the use of spies by the government on ordinary people, and so on. Here, rather than a sunny, brightly lit world where everybody, or nearly so, is happy, as in Brave New World, everything here is dingy and gray. Walls are covered with peeling wallpaper or posters of Big Brother partially flapping in the wind. Food and drink are scarce. Buildings are cold and crumbling. Clothing is old, worn, threadbare. Here there is no joy. There is only work and the party. Here one is constantly watched whether by the video screen in one's apartment, which everyone has, every room has, or by the posters everywhere showing Big Brother with the words, Big Brother is watching you, or by one's neighbors or by one's co-workers, or if one has children, by one's children, who are encouraged to turn you in to the government. The highest duty is to support Big Brother and the party. And if that means turning in your parents or siblings, then so be it. In this world, certain thoughts are crimes, as are certain ideas. And to indulge a thought crime, even for a moment, can result in one's re-education or one's disappearance. The purpose of the party, the propaganda, the fear, the thought police, is all to maintain the status quo, to keep the party in power and to oppress and repress all dissent, no matter the cause. This is what the party says are its aims. This is one of the founding documents of the party. And I'm reading a small selection of a very large portion in the middle of the book. The two aims of the party are to conquer the whole surface of the earth and to extinguish once and for all the possibility of independent thought. There are therefore two great problems which the party is concerned to solve. One is how to discover, against his will, what another human being is thinking. And the other is how to kill several hundred million people in a few seconds without giving warning beforehand. Insofar as scientific research still continues, this is its subject matter. The scientist of today is either a mixture of psychologist and inquisitor studying with real, ordinary minuteness 
the meaning of facial expressions, gestures, tones of voice, and testing the truth-producing effects of drugs, shock therapy, hypnosis, and physical torture. Or he is a chemist, physicist, or biologist, concerned only with such branches of his special subject as are relevant to the taking of life. Pretty powerful stuff. The next passage shows how far the party is willing to go to convert those who disagree with it. Brief background. Protagonist of the novel is a man named Winston Smith. He's been captured by the party by someone he thought he thought was a friend, okay, named O'Brien. O'Brien, it turns out to be a high-level functionary of the party. So Winston Smith has been undergoing torture slash re-education. And he's being interrogated by O'Brien, and he thinks to himself, this is not audible. Why bother to torture me? Thought Winston with a momentary bitterness. O'Brien checked his step as though Winston had uttered the thought aloud. His large, ugly face came nearer, with the eyes a little narrowed. And one more little aside. There's a fantastic film of 1984 with Richard Burton as O'Brien and a very young John Hurd as Winston Smith. Highly recommended. O'Brien retorts, you are thinking, he said, that since we intend to destroy you utterly so that nothing that you say or do can make the smallest difference, in that case, why do we go to the trouble of interrogating you first? That is what you were thinking, was it not? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien smiled slightly. You are a flaw in the pattern, Winston. You are a stain that must be wiped out. Did I not tell you just now that we are different from the persecutors of the past? We are not content with negative obedience, nor even with the most abject submission. When finally you surrender to us, it must be of your own free will. We do not destroy the heretic because he resists us. So long as he resists us, we never destroy him. We convert him. We capture his inner mind. We reshape him. We burn all evil and all illusion out of him. We bring him over to our side, not in appearance, but genuinely, heart and soul. We make him one of ourselves before we kill him. It is intolerable to us that an erroneous thought should exist anywhere in the world. However secret and powerless it may be. Even in the instant of death, we cannot permit any deviation. In the old days, the heretic walked to the stake, still a heretic, proclaiming his heresy, exulting in it. Even the victim of the Russian purges could carry rebellion locked up in his skull as he walked down the passage waiting for the bullet. But we make the brain perfect before we blow it. The command of the old despotisms was, thou shalt not. The command of the totalitarians was, thou shalt. Our command is, thou art. No one whom we bring to this place ever stands out against us. Everyone is washed clean. Now to the last novel. Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which he wrote in 1950. Set somewhere in America, in the future, Fahrenheit 451 is about a society that has firemen and fire departments whose sole job is to start fires. They're book burners. They burn books because of the dangers books pose to society. In a lengthy section, about a third of the way into the novel, Captain Beatty, the fire chief, explains to Montag, the protagonist, who is a fireman, why books are dangerous and how the country moved from valuing and reading books to fearing and burning them. Now, remember, Bradbury wrote this in 1950. When did it all start? Beatty asks. 
This job of ours, how did it come about? Where? When? Well, I'd say it really got started around about a thing called the Civil War. Even though our rule book claims it was found earlier. The fact is, we didn't get along well until photography came into its own. Then motion pictures in the early 20th century. Radio, television, things began to have mass. Picture it. 19th century man with his horses, dogs, carts, slow motion. Then in the 20th century, speed up your camera. Books cut shorter, condensations, digests, tabloids. Everything boils down to the gag, the snap ending. Skipping a little bit, he continues on. Classic cut to 15-minute radio shows. Then cut again to fill a two-minute book column, winding up at last as a 10 or 12-line dictionary resume. I exaggerate, of course. We have those very books today. I've got a dozen of them in my office. The distillation of the classics in a couple of columns. School is shortened. Discipline relaxed. Philosophies, histories, languages dropped. English and spelling gradually neglected. Sound like anything? Finally, almost completely ignored. Life is immediate. The job counts. Pleasure lies about after work. Why learn anything save pressing buttons, pulling switches, fitting nuts and bolts? The zipper displaces the button, and a man lacks just that much time to think while dressing at dawn. A philosophical hour, and thus a melancholy hour. Perhaps my favorite line in the entire novel. He goes on. He skips some, or we're skipping some, but he goes on. Now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? Bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers, merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial, are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts, lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla and tapioca. Books, so the damned snobbish critic said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling. There you have it, Montag. It didn't come from government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with. No. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick. Thank God. Why? Because we must all be alike, Beatty says. Not everyone born free and equal, as the Constitution says, but everyone made equal. Each man the image of every other, then all are happy. For there are no mountains to make them cower, no to judge themselves against. So, a book is a loaded gun in the house next door. Burn it. Take the shot from the weapon. Breach man's mind. Who knows who might be the target of the well-read man? Me? I won't stomach them for a minute. And so when houses were finally fireproof completely all over the world, there was no longer need of firemen for the old purposes. They were given the new job as custodians of our peace of mind. The focus of our understandable and rightful dread of being inferior. Official censors, judges, and executors. That's you, Montag. That's you and I. You must understand that our civilization is so vast, we can't have our minorities upset and stirred. Ask yourself, what do we want in this country? Above all, people want to be happy. Isn't that right? Maybe.
1950. Haven't you heard it all your life? I want to be happy, people say. Well, aren't they? Don't we keep them moving? Don't we give them fun? That's all we live for, isn't it? For pleasure, for titillation? And you must admit, our culture provides plenty of these. Last part. Colored people don't like little black sambo? Burn it. White people don't feel good about Uncle Tom's Cabin? Burn it. Someone's written a book on tobacco and cancer of the lungs? The cigarette, cigarette people are weeping? Burn the book. Serenity, Montag. Peace, Montag. These are just three works of dystopian fiction from the 20th century. There are scores more. Indeed, one can almost say that the 20th century was the dystopian century, especially considering how it began. You know, the thought was that when the 20th century began, it would be because there was a magazine named after it, the Progressive Century. And there was another magazine that began publication titled The Christian Century. Less than a decade and a half in, what happened? The war to end all wars. Well, then how did that century also end? And I'm going to fudge on the date a little bit. I think September 11, 2001. Those are our bookends. World War I and the Twin Towers. One overarching quality to these three novels that I've read and to many other dystopian novels is that they're highly philosophical. The passages I read to you largely explain how and why the world got the way it was in the novels. The authors are interested primarily in ideas and how people respond to them or in how one class or group of people think they know what is best for them and for all people, and how they get power and use that power to control people. We see an element of that in The Hunger Games, all three novels, but not front and center like it is in Brave New World 1984 and Fahrenheit 451. Rather, the dystopian world that we see in The Hunger Games, I suggest, is merely a setting serving as an antagonist to Katniss. The dystopian world is a character within the novel. See, the philosophy behind the repression in The Hunger Games is not as fully explained and detailed as it is in the other novels we've been discussing. Rather, the dystopia is almost like a backdrop, simply used to show up primarily the relationships among Katniss, Gale, Peta, Hamish, Finnick, and others, and their relationship with the capital and the power structure of Pan Am. It is their relationships that really drive the action of the novels, not a philosophical argument or an idea supporting the dystopia that the author wants us, one, to think about, and two, in each of the three previous books, to reject. See, none of those authors are saying, hey, this is a great world, let's make it so. They're all saying, this is a danger. We need to flee from this. And it's for that reason, primarily, that I don't see the Hunger Games trilogy as a work of dystopian fiction. Rather, I think it belongs more to what Tolkien calls fairy story. Now, I'm not gonna argue that it fully fulfills what Tolkien calls fairy story, but it does have the elements. But I think it's Tolkienian fairy story, or it's more fairy story, largely because of its ending, but also because of certain elements and ideas that Suzanne Collins embeds within the story. Interestingly, the same years that Huxley, Orwell, and Bradbury are writing their novels, Tolkien is writing the tales that would become the Silmarillion, the Hobbit, and the Lord of the Rings. Okay. He also produced two major works of literary criticism, an essay on Beowulf in 1936 titled Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, 
in a little short essay, well, actually it's not that short, it's about 60 pages, titled On Fairy Stories, that he delivered to St. Andrews University in Scotland in 1939 as the Andrew Lang lecture for that year. It was later published on fairy stories, it was later published in 1947 in a book that C.S. Lewis edited um, as a memorial volume to their friend Charles Williams who had died unexpectedly in a book titled Essays Presented to Charles Williams. And then Tolkien revised it slightly again for a publication in 1966. In this essay, which is much too long to discuss in its entirety in the time we have, Tolkien averts that fairy stories as a branch of literature are not necessarily for children. They're for adults, because children have little need of them. And what he means by that is that adults have greater need of the four things that fairy stories offer. Those four things are fantasy, recovery, escape, and consolation. And what he means by that is that adults, often confronted, confronted with the dreary aspects of life, work, taxes, bills, health problems, if not their own, their children's, are more in need of fantasy recovery, escape, and consolation than our children. Why? Because children often live in a world of fantasy. Their imaginations haven't been dulled by growing old. I contend it is these four qualities that the Hunger Games novels offer adults that qualifies them to be understood as fairy stories. And it's kind of interesting when you think about it because like the Harry Potter stories, the Hunger Games novels have come to be read probably by more adults than by children. And the films have been seen probably by many more adults than they have by young adolescents. So, what does Tolkien mean by these terms? Let's start with fantasy. And I've got to move quickly. Fantasy. He says it's the mental capability of forming images in the mind of things that do not occur in the world. Okay? But it's more than that. So let me read a passage. Tolkien says, The perception of the image, the grasp of its implications, that is what it means, and the control which are necessary to a successful expression may vary in vividness and strength. That is, every person in this room has an imaginative faculty or capability. Some of us are probably more creative than others. The achievement of the expression, that is the getting from up here to out here, that's another aspect of fantasy. And he said we need to name that. That's art. That's art. Art is the moving from up here to down in the real world. Okay? So he says I need a word that embraces both the art, the sub-creative art in itself, the imagination up here, and a quality of strangeness and wonder in the expression, that is, in the final product, the literary story, the painting, the musical composition, etc. And so he says, fantasy is the word I'm going to use there. Okay? So what does fantasy mean? It implies this unreality, okay? because it's dealing with something that's not in this world. But it also includes strangeness and wonder. Right? So if it lacked wonder and strangeness, then what could fantasy include? Brave New World, 1984 and Fahrenheit 451, because those are all pretty unreal. But they lack that sense of wonder. Okay? But fantasy is more than just oddity and wonder and strangeness. Tolkien says it leads to something else, a sense of enchantment. Okay? That is, there is a quality of the work that produces a, what he calls a secondary world. And while we are reading it or viewing it, we enter into that world. 
And while we are in that world, what is there is real and is true. It follows the laws of that world. If it's well done. If it's not well done, if there are internal inconsistencies, we kind of immediately are kicked back out. Because we say, well, that doesn't make sense. Earlier, the writer said, okay. He gets close to the end of the essay, or the end of the section on fantasy, and he makes this little statement. Creative fantasy is founded upon the hard recognition that things are so in the world as it appears under the sun, a recognition of fact, but not of slavery to it. What does he mean? Things are so in the world as it appears under the sun. He says, in works of creative fantasy, authors recognize the world that we inhabit has problems. There is poverty, there is hunger, there is racism, there is terrorism, there is death. But they're not enslaved to that fact. What can they do? They can create worlds where possibly there isn't racism, there isn't poverty, there isn't hunger, there isn't death. Or they can create worlds where we see those things, but in that secondary imaginary, imaginary world, we experience it in such a way that it opens our eyes to the real problem in our world. Okay? So it recognizes them, it accepts them, but it doesn't say this is the way it must be. So where do we see those qualities of fantasy in the Hunger Games? How similar is the world of the novels to our world? Well, we do learn that it is set in what used to be the United States, though long after a nuclear war. So it's our world, but it kind of isn't our world. What else? Is there strangeness? You see those hovercraft, you know, come out of nowhere. They're invisible and they suddenly appear. What else? How about the organization of Pan Am into districts? And continuing down to even the, the technological innovations, the poverty, even the dystopian qualities, aren't those an aspect of strangeness? Doesn't it kind of hit you in between the eyes when you first see it? What about wonder? It's not enough to just have strangeness. I think there's essentially one place that the books are designed to provide that feeling of wonder, of awe, of mystery, of glory, as it were. And this place definitely does for Katniss and Gale. And it's the forest. And notice what they have to do to go to the forest. They have to go outside the fence. What are they doing? They're going outside the world of Pan Am at that point. They're leaving the dystopia behind and going into what? The, the real utopia, the natural world as God made it. Because notice the forest and the meadow that they go into. They're what? They are untouched by human hands. They're perfectly natural, okay? And how, how does Katniss feel when she goes there? <sighs> There's utter relief. Notice even her name is taken from what? A plant that grows in the pond there. Her name isn't taken from the world of Pan M. Neither is Prem's name. Prem's name comes from Primrose, which grows outside the fence. If that doesn't provide a sense of wonder, I don't know what does. Even when Katniss is in the arena, you sense that that's, she's in her element. Why? Because most often, what does the arena contain? The natural world. Trees, streams, brush. It's where she feels at home, which is really unfair because it gives her the upper hand on all of the other tributes. All right? How about this for wonder? When she buries Rue with the flowers and sings. Here you have someone who is in essentially the Colosseum and whose job is to kill other people. What does she do? She honors someone else who she made friends with 
And then she sings this song, knowing full well while she's singing it, her every move is being watched. But what else is her singing the song an indication of? It's rebellion. Okay? When they're in the woods, it revives them. It connects them and us with wonder, with beauty, with awe. When she sees the dandelion at the end of the third book, the same thing. Because what does the dandelion mean for her? Hope, renewal. Life can start over. And I don't just mean over for her. It means over for the world, for the whole society. Okay? Tolkien says recovery is the next quality. What is it? Tolkien. Recovery, which includes return, return and renewal of health, is a regaining, regaining of a clear view. I might venture to say, seeing things as we are or were meant to see them. As, what does he mean by that? As things apart from ourselves. This is really important. We need, in any case, to clean our windows so that the things seen clearly may be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity, from possessiveness. Of all faces, those of our familiars, that is, the people we're closest to, are the ones both most difficult to play, play fantastic tricks with and most difficult really to see with fresh attention, perceiving their likeness and unlikeness, that they are faces and yet unique faces. He says this triteness is really the penalty of appropriation. What does he mean? We say we know them, that is, these people that we're very close to, but they have become like the things which once attracted us by their glitter or their color or their shape, and we laid hands on them and then locked them in our hoard, acquired them, and acquiring ceased to look at them. Every time I read that, it stings. I mean, it's like a sword thrust to the gut. We don't look at our loved ones. Not really, Tolkien is saying. Why? Because we look at them, and what do we see? We see the image we've created of them in our minds because we've known them for so long. We don't see them as separate, distinct, whole, apart from ourselves. I look at my wife, who I've known for over 30 years, and I acknowledge her as my wife, whom I've known for over 30 years, rather than as someone totally separate. Own thoughts, own ideas, own values, own feelings, etc. So Tolkien's saying we need to take these off and we need to clean them. Why? Because they're dirty. They're encrusted. And we need to remove the rubbish of appropriation. It means not only looking at people with fresh eyes. It means looking at everything. You walked into this room and you probably saw, yeah, there's walls and windows and a roof. But did you pay attention to the kind of ceiling? or the kind of floor. It's a hardwood floor, but notice the hardwood floor. It's made of individual strips. They're not all the same size. The seams aren't all in the same place. I do this in my classes. I tell my students, look at the walls. And I look at the wall and go, okay, they're walls. No, they're not just walls. They're concrete block, and between the concrete block, there's mortar. And even in the concrete block, there's texture, etc. And they kind of go, wow. What's Tolkien mean? We have to kind of, do this. Step outside our normal perspective and see things anew. When we do that, Tolkien suggests, then we'll perceive a little of the glory of God that permeates everything. Paul says that it's through Christ that we live, move, have our being, that he sustains and upholds everything. So how do we receive recovery in the novels? What scenes help cleanse our lenses? I think of Katniss, for example. 
the very first book. She comes back from the forest. They're getting ready for the pulling of the names. What does she see? What has her mother done? Anybody remember? She's laid out her, the mother's, best dress for Katniss to wear. It kind of shocks her because she doesn't expect it. Because her mother seemingly has been rather useless for the last six months or so since her father died. Several years, actually. She sees her mother in a new light. Well, I take that, and what does it mean for me? For me to see people in a new light, not to pigeonhole them, not to assume I know what they will do. In other words, to let them surprise me. Because if I expect them to do something and they do it, what does that mean? Well, they've just fulfilled an obligation. But if I don't expect them, then what happens? It becomes a gift. That's partially what recovery entails. Again, when Peter and Katniss meet on the roof of the tribute center, what happens before then? They have the interview with Caesar Flicker, uh, Flickerman. And what does Peter do? He's the last one to be interviewed. He tells the whole world of his undying love for Katniss. She's not all that happy about that. In the book, she knocks him up against the wall so that he falls and cuts his hand open okay, on a planter. Later on, she can't sleep. She goes up to the rooftop, and there's Peta. Why is he up there? Because he tells her he doesn't want to do things according to the way the city wants or the capital wants. He wants to do things on his own. But also just being up there, what happens to Katniss? She realizes the truth of what Hamish said Peter did for her. He said, you know, listen, sweetheart, he made you, what, vulnerable and desirable. Because he says, you know, those are two qualities you really lack. You come across pretty cold and hard. And he says he might just have helped you get some sponsors. Where else? Seeing Finnick reunited with Annie causes us to see how we should see the, those we love. Seeing Finnick ally himself with Katniss and Peta teaches us what? Not to judge by appearance. When we first meet Finnick, how's he come across? He's this cocky, headstrong guy. He's hitting on Katniss, chewing, you know, blocks of sugar. And what do we find out? It's all an act. This guy, frankly, is one of the greatest characters in the, all the novels. This guy has depth to him. He has honor to him. He has loyalty to him. What about Peta in the final novel? What enables his recovery and through his recovery for us to have our lenses cleansed? How about love? Just simple love. His love for Katniss and hers for him. It's his knowing, you love me. Real or not real? Real. That restores his sanity. What about escape? The third item Tolkien talks about. Escape from what? What kind of escape? Isn't escapist literature bad for children? And adults? No, says Tolkien says. No. Well, actually, it depends on the kind of escape. Or what Tolkien calls the escape of the prisoner rather than the flight of the deserter. So what does he mean? Why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison, Tolkien writes, he tries to get out and go home? Think of a prisoner of war. What's his first duty? To try to escape. Or it used to be at least. 
Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls. That is, just because you're in prison, does that mean you must only think and talk about being in prison? If one's experience of the world is horrendous, why shouldn't one try to create a world less horrendous? Or should, why should one only talk about the horrors of the world? It reminds me, for those of you who are C.S. Lewis lovers, of that scene in the silver chair. They're down in the underworld king, kingdom of the witch, and Puddleglum and Jill and Eustace are there. And what do we see? The witch is convincing them there is no world up there. This is all there is. Puddleglum says, Suppose we have only dreamed or made up all those things. Trees and grass and sun and moon and stars and Aslan himself. Suppose we have. And all I can say is that in that case, the made up things seem a good deal more important than the real ones. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. It strikes me as a pretty poor. I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. So what is there to escape from? Poverty in our world. Poverty, racism, terrorism, hunger, injustice. Need I go on? Tolkien finally gets to the, what he calls the great escape, death. He says it's what most of the tales of the elves are about, deathlessness. Death, what Hamlet calls the undiscovered country from whose born no man returns. It has plagued humanity from the beginning, seemingly. We first get that glimpse of escape or the need of escape, again, when we see Katniss do what? Go into the woods. She's escaping her world, her society. She's leaving the mundane world of District 12. But let's leave the little problems, facetiously said, of poverty, hatred, and hunger, and such, and go on to the big ones, like death. How do Katniss and Peta force Seneca Crane to name them both victors in the first book. Katniss has the nightlock berries. And Peter's like, she goes, trust me. She pours some in his hand on the count of three. One, two, would they have gone through with it? It's an interesting question. I think they would have. Because what would it mean? It would mean the capital has no victors. Talk about throwing a monkey wrench into the system. Notice, they're willing to die rather than what? Rather than to allow the games to win. How's that for escape? Are there things we're willing to die for? No. Look at the girl who was just recently announced, died while in the hands of ISIS, Kayla Mueller. She died for something she was willing to die for, helping other people. How about when Katniss finally does become the Mockingjay in the third book? What does it take for her to finally accept that role? It takes the destruction of that field hospital that we talked about last night. And how does she reply? She turns and faces that camera, completely unscripted. I want to tell the rebels that I am alive, that I'm right here in District 8, where the Capitol has just bombed a hospital full of unarmed men, women, and children. There will be no survivors. I want to tell people that if you think for one second the Capitol will treat us fairly if there's a ceasefire, you're deluding yourself. Because you know who they are and what they do. This is what they do. And she points to the fires behind them. And we must fight back. President Snow says he's sending us a message. Well, I have one for him. 
You can torture us and bomb us and burn our districts to the ground. But do you see that? And she points to the burning hospital. Fire is catching. And if we burn, you burn with us. I don't know about you, but that shows me that there are issues and problems greater than my own and worth fighting for. Finally, consolation. What does he mean? Tolkien writes about the consolation of fairy stories, the joy of the happy ending, or more correctly, of the good catastrophe. The sudden joyous turn, for there is no true end to any fairy tale. This joy, which is one of the things which fairy stories can produce supremely well, is not escapist nor fugitive. In its fairy tale or other world setting, it is a sudden and miraculous grace. Notice, that is theological language. Recount never to be recounted on, sorry, never to be counted on to recur. It does not deny the existence of discatastrophe or sorrow and failure. In fact, the possibility of these is necessary to the joy of deliverance. It denies, in the face of much evidence, if you will, universal final defeat. And insofar is Evangelium, the good news, giving a fleeting glimpse of joy, joy beyond the walls of the world, poignant in grief, poignant as grief. Two other comments by Tolkien, and then I'll kind of wrap this up. It's the mark of a good fairy story of the higher or more complete kind, that however wild its events, however fantastic or terrible the adventures, it can give the child or man that hears it when the turn, when that you catastrophe occurs, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, near to or indeed accompanied by tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art. Far more powerful and poignant is the effect in a serious tale of fairy. In such stories, when the sudden turn comes, we get a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire that for a moment passes outside the frame, rends the very web of story, and lets a gleam come through. Before returning to the Hunger Games, let me give two examples that probably everyone in here is familiar with but you'll just fall out of your seats almost by these. One is from Charles Schultz, Charlie Brown Christmas, and the other is from Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Do you remember the scene in a Charlie Brown Christmas when Charlie Brown gets his tree and he thinks he kills it and goes, ah! Can anyone tell me the true meaning of Christmas? And Linus steps up. I'll tell you the true meaning of Christmas, Charlie Brown. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Similarly, the Grinch, having stolen all the toys, all the Christmas trees, all the food goes up on the top of Mount Crumpet and every who in Whoville, the tall and the small was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, eyes cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without boxes, packages, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. 
And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. So where do we see that kind of consolation in the Hunger Games? Where is the eucatastrophe? Or where are there little eucatastrophes? How about when Mags tells Fennec to stop carrying her, pick up Peta, and she runs back into the fog? How about when Peta throws Katniss the bread? What about when Fennec, Boggs, and all the others die? Sorry to give that away if you haven't read the novels. So that Katniss can go on. Maybe even Katniss's shooting of coin. Do you ever expect that to happen? You expect her to take her shot right at President Snow. Ultimately, I think it's when Katniss finally accepts that she can have happiness and joy with PETA. Quote, on the night I feel that thing again, that romantic stirring, the hunger that overtook me on the beach, I know this would have happened anyway. That what I need to survive is not Gale's fire kindled with rage and hatred. I have plenty of fire myself. Meaning, she has plenty of rage and hatred. What I need it's the dandelion in the spring. The bright yellow that means rebirth instead of destruction. The promise that life can go on no matter how bad our losses. That it can be good again. And only Peta can give me that. So after, when he whispers, you love me, real or not real? I tell him, real. Thank you. Thank you. If we had time, I was going to read Tolkien's epilogue to the fairy story essay. Um, I highly encourage you to read it because it it'll blow your mind. Was the epilogue original to all? Was that part of the revisions, or was that original to the first composition? Um.